Welcome, Climate Viewers. This is Jim Lee, the Climate Viewer Guy from ClimateViewer.com with Facts Minus Fear Porn. It is 2019, and I've been holding on to this one for a little while. China is off the chain um, with their weather modification programs, projects. Uh, they're spending all that money that we spent on all their bullshit at Walmart uh, to really control the weather, to screw with the ionosphere, and possibly screw with your brain. So we're going to get into all of that, de all the details over on climateviewer.com. Link is already in the details under references. I'll drop that in chat for you guys so you guys can play along at home. Um, so this is getting kind of crazy. I've got five main points to this article. I'm going to go through it pretty rapidly. I have been sick as a dog for the last week. Uh, basically, nose and throat, uh, really, really crazy stuff. But nobody's talking about China and uh, they're basically you know if you if you watch any news all it is is either imp impeach Trump or you know look into the FISA abuse you know just, you know the politics today suck and the news sucks even worse so we're gonna break this down for you um, before we do that I just want to remind everybody everything that you're about to see is Creative Commons free of charge you're able to remix it put it on your website use it however you like as long as you don't sell it and you give a link back to the original all i ask in return is that you support me with a monthly donation on patreon.com slash climate viewer or a one-time donation on paypal or gofundme um no i did not get my flu shot uh, don't do flu shots ever since i got my first flu shot that's when i developed graves disease coincidence you be the judge um but i haven't had a flu shot since 2009 and you know shortly thereafter my thyroid started screwing up on me and i got the flu to boot so <laughs> you know so not doing the flu shots anyway uh over on climateviewer.com i've just updated it uh pretty significantly i put the last couple of videos up in case you have missed them uh, we've got David Keyes sun dimming experiment scope X possibly coming spring 2019 all the facts the history of weather control and interactive timeline geoengineering governance India monsoons plain farts and dead people uh, this <laughs> pretty fascinating uh, video there you guys got to check it out and the topic of the day China's mind-blowing weather modification, geoengineering, and elf transmitter projects. So, thousands of cloud seeding generators in Tibet, a new ionospheric heater, steering rivers in the sky, something you guys have heard me talk about many times over the years, and an ELF transmitter five times the size of New York City. And it's all kind of summed up in this one image here. Um, you got the cloud seeding generators all over Tibet. You've got satellites in space that are going to help them steer atmospheric rivers over here to the desert. Um, and uh, underneath we've got the ELF transmitter and the sensor locations that are generic. Of course, the Chinese government does not want us to know where their ELF generator is. You could bet your sweet ass that if they update the satellite photography, um, anything past uh, the last couple years, I'm going to find that thing and put it on my map at climateviewer.org, so stay tuned for that. But let's dig right into it. So up number one, China covering Tibet in thousands of cloud seeding generators. Um, this is a really interesting one. Now, I, I covered all of this stuff. To begin with um, a couple months ago and some interesting developments have happened since then uh, turns out he, we're gonna blur the lines between what's cloud seeding and weather modification and geoengineering and I've got the world's top historian and the etc group agreeing that this is the case um, China's planning on deploying thousands of silver iodide burning cloud seeding generators 
generate snow on the Tibetan plateau in an attempt to alleviate water shortages. The massive scale of these experimental devices is troubling enough, but the ETC group warned that these devices could be easily converted for geoengineering purposes. Now, I got an email from the ETC group that said, this year we've been tracking a few high-profile geoengineering experiments in Arizona. That's uh, the Scope X, David Keith thing. Alaska, the ICE 911, California, the Marine Cloud Brightening Project, and Chile, an ocean iron fertilization experiment and solar radiation management experiment. Another massive project recently came to light on the Tibetan Plateau. New research exposes what might be the largest geoengineering project to date. A weather modification project in the Himalayas, which is also part of an alarming pattern of disposition dispossession of indigenous inhabitants. While a weather modification project at this scale is alarming enough, the infrastructure used could easily transfer over to stratospheric aerosol injection. Whoa, 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 hold the phone. So, of course, I had to reach out to the world's top historian on uh, weather modification and all the like. And on Twitter, I said to Jim Fleming, James Roger Fleming, if you guys don't know him, you should by now. Uh, he is the author of Fixing the Sky, The Checkered History of Weather Modification. Everybody should go buy that book. Um, I said, I told him about ETC Group's email and the Mothra effect that we talked about at the AMS conference. And he said, yes, massive chemical cloud seeding of this type and of the type proposed in the 1950s by Irving Langmuir are of the scale to be considered climate intervention. So for those who haven't kept up on the latest jargon, geoengineering became climate engineering became climate intervention. And here's how this works. There is a group called the DC Geoengineering Group. They renamed themselves the Forum for Climate Engineering Assessment, FCEA. So they were the DC Geo Group, now they're the FCEA, Forum for Climate Engineering Assessment. And then just recently in the CIA funded NAS, National Academy of Sciences report, they called it climate intervention. So that's the latest terminology. And of course, I blamed all that on the CIA and uh, was kind of put in my place by Dr. Jim Fleming when I met him and interviewed him. He said, no, actually, that was my idea. <laughs> so I was like, okay, um, fair enough. But regardless, the latest term for all of this is climate intervention. And the reason why is because engineering is a bad thing. Engineering is like your car. You don't want your car to break down, so you certainly don't want your climate to break down. So they don't want to call it geoengineering or climate engineering. They want to call it climate intervention because that's all they're doing. They're intervening in the climate, and they really can't control a thing. So just a little bit of history there. Um, back to the story. So I've broken this down a couple different ways. This is what the actual Chinese uh, cloud seeding generator looks like. Um, then I have a schematic of what typical cloud seeding generators look like. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with how these things work, um, this is the fancy remote controlled version that's got the solar panel and the big propane tanks and it's got a satellite communication so that somebody can work it with their cell phone and turn it on and off. And then over here you got the old school redneck version where uh, this elderly gentleman um, walks outside and literally sparks a match over top of it and burns some acetylene and silver iodide and acetone. Yay. So how does it work? It, uh, it's called orographic cloud seeding. I like this little animation. Um, if anybody's ever watched Seven Years in Tibet, they'll recognize the flags and the Himalayas. Uh, but we got a great little graphic right here, which shows you how it works, and I'll let it start over. One, we've got the monsoon. The winds blow up the, the mountains. The mountains carry the 
the plume aloft, it hits the rain clouds and supposedly puts snow on top of the mountains. That snow melts and ends up in rainwater running down, and that's orographic cloud seeding. So there you go, um, some images on that. And this is where they plan on cloud seeding, and that's what's in the original graphic. So that's number one. Um, some of the articles associated with this are pretty freaking nuts. Uh, if you look on each of these, I've kind of changed up my format now. So you'll see references number one through four. If you click on that, it'll scroll you down to the references section. And you can see uh, China needs more water. So it's building a rain making network three times the size of Spain. China's radical $168 million weather control system revealed. Um, and uh, the list goes on. Geoengineering. China to install hundreds of thousands of fuel burning chambers in Tibet to induce rainfall. I may go um, mute every second or so because I'm still coughing up a lung. But regardless, uh, let's hop back up to the top. So we've done number one. All right, next up we have number two. China and Russia work together on ionospheric heating experiment. Um, let's actually, let's do this. This will make this fun for me. So let's go to this. Do, 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 do. Five and six. All right, so um, this is where the original source of this is. Um, this is from South, South China Morning Post. China and Russia band together for controversial heating experiments to modify the atmosphere. And they show a picture of a satellite. The countries are testing a technology for possible military applications, say Chinese scientists involved in the project. Militaries have been in a race to control the ionosphere, which allows radio signals to bounce long distances for communications for decades. And they go through all the details about how China and Russia work together on the Sura um, ionospheric heater. So a total of five experiments were carried out in June. Uh, one on June 7th caused a physical disturbance over an area of as large as 126,000 square kilometers, 49,000 square miles, or about half the size of Britain. That's a big, big burning hole in the sky. Um, the modified zone looming more than 500 kilometers high over Vas Vasilsersk, a small Russian town in Eastern Europe, experienced an electric spike with 10 times more negatively charged subatomic particles than surrounding regions. I'm um, not going to read the whole thing to you. I hope you guys will go to the link and actually read all this stuff because it's very, very interesting. Um, and then there's actually a scientific paper associated with it, which was provided by Chris Fallen, the director of HARP. I reached out to him about this article, and he sent me a link to the actual article, and you can see it here. It may come up, it may not. It takes forever. This website's extremely slow. But the, for, the first joint experimental results between Sura and CSES. So this is the actual scientific paper on what was going on there. Um, it was just recently published. And it's the China Seismo Electromagnetic Satellite, which I have a picture of here. So on this side, we have the Sura Ionospheric Heating Instrument. Um, it is a ionospheric heater similar to HARP. It has been around much longer than HARP, uh, at least since the 80s. And, uh, you know, they cook the sky with that thing. And then next to that is the CSES, China Seismo Electromagnetic Satellite. Now, this is very similar to what goes on with HARP. Um, with HARP, and I got the details right here, uh, the HARP Ionospheric Research Instrument in Gakona, Alaska, and the Demeter or Demeter satellite. So, this is a satellite in space. It's actually measuring 
you know, what the ionospheric heater is doing. So China supplied the satellite, Russia had the heater, they worked together. And you have to ask yourself why, you know, why is, um, cause this is extremely rare according to the sources. Um, you know, they never work together, um, on this sort of thing. Um, but then they had the question answers itself. And the next part, number three, China building their own ionospheric heater. It seems that the joint Russia-China ionospheric heating experiments mentioned above are in preparation for China's own brand new heater or incoherent scatter radar, dubbed the Sonya High-Powered Incoherent Scatter Radar. Um, so this sucker, not a lot of details on it. Um, but according to them, the, the goal was to develop the, and build the world's most advanced ISR ever. So we'll see how that works out. Um, declined to comment on the facility's military applications, of course. And uh, <laughs> it's too early to talk about what the technology could do. There'll be lots of technical challenges and engineering hurdles we may face and have to overcome. The main purpose of the program is to study the ionosphere over the South China Sea. Currently, there is no such device in the region. The data collected by our instrument will fill gaps in our knowledge. There were other similar facilities under construction in China with a power output much larger than ours. Gulp. So obviously this isn't the only one um, and they are building multiple ionospheric heaters in uh, China. Scary stuff. For those who aren't familiar with what how this stuff works, you got your ionospheric heater down here. It cooks uh, the ionosphere typically from 150 to 500 kilometers, generally speaking 300 kilometers. Um, what are called the D, E, and F um, regions of the ionosphere. Um, and then they see what kind of, you know, effects that has on radio transmissions from satellites, from ground, and all that sort of thing. Make plasma fireballs in the sky. Um, you know, basically using the, as um, the one of the directors of HARP said, Bob McCoy, a laboratory without walls. So now the Chinese are going to be playing with, uh, you know, incoherent scatter radars as well. Yay. Makes me all happy inside. So scatter radar facilities around the world, obviously Harp in Alaska, Sonderstrom in Greenland, Millstone Hill, Massachusetts. That's the Haystack University, Arecibo, Puerto Rico, Jicamarca, Peru, Svalbard, Norway, Ram for nobody can pronounce Norwegian. Oh my gosh, nobody. I'm southern. Give me a break. Um, Ram Shord Moen. We'll try that. <laughs> Norway. Um, that it should say Tromso, Norway. I don't know why the hell it says that. Kharkov, Ukraine, Irkutsk, Russia, Shigaraki, Japan, and Sanya Hainan. And the Sanya one is the new one they're building. But I've got, of course, you know me, I got a map. So here's my better map. Um, wait a minute, that's not it. So this is my map, ionospheric heater map. And you can go over to climateviewer.org and check that bad boy out. And you can see all of these incoherent scatter radars yourself. So like the one up in Sonderstrom, you can actually see it. There's photos. It's 3.5 million watts. Um, let's go see what that was. There's Tromso. Let's go look real quick. What did they have in there? They had Svalbard, Norway. Oh, look. What do I got in Norway? Oh, there is one in Norway. Spear. Okay. Yeah. That's the Spear. Um... Space Plasma Exploration by Arctic Active Radar, SPEAR. I was wondering what the heck that was. Um, and of course, as you can see, I got way more dots than their little map here. But yes, I have all the big ones like the one in Arecibo, Puerto Rico, and like um, 
they don't have these over here, obviously. Platteville's closed down. Um, Shigaraki. No, that's Chung Lee. Here's Shigaraki. Check that thing out. Pretty freaking fancy looking. Um, I think this is the coolest looking one by far. If you, there can be such a thing. <laughs> um, but it's a really, really big image of it, as you can see. Uh, right. And it's got these hexagons to it and you know, very similar design to the other one. But anyway, so there, there you go. There's all of the ionospheric heaters of the world. I'll drop that map in chat for you guys too, so you can play along at home. Um, all right, so back to the story. Let's close these out because I'm already getting two minute thing things. Um, but you know, you can see those links right here, and there's a link right there, number five, to the actual scientific paper on the joint uh, Russia China thing. And uh, the ionospheric heater thing is right below that. Um, it's right here. Could this new Chinese radar system be used to play God with the weather? Uh, yeah, you got to love the way they put this stuff. China's building a system in the South China Sea that can knock out communication systems, but some scientists believe it could have more alarming uses, such as causing natural disasters like hurricanes. And they're talking about the ionospheric heater. And you go down here, and uh, if you look, they got a nice little picture. That's where I got these from. And uh, their ISR map. But down here at the bottom, what do you know? There's a uh, phased array antenna system that's mobile. So, like I've been saying, uh, you know, these guys, they they can make... What's up, a &R Farms? Holler at your boy. Uh, Juan Martinez. Uh, Juan Martinez. O'Doyle. Man, I was beginning to wonder if you were a real dude. <laughs> What's up, O'Doyle? <laughs> G. Anderson, Cecil Jansen. Love you guys mean it. Carol Ryan in North Carolina. Radical Ralph Rousseau. Climate Crime. Best name in the house. It's hilarious to me. All right. What's up, guys? Um, but, yeah, so this is a, a photo they have in here. And What do they say about it? Uh, damn it. The scatter radars are more powerful than conventional military radar systems. Photo defense blog. So apparently they're saying that this is an ISR and it's similar actually to what's going on up here. Um, it's like the poker flat ISR. This is the AM ISR, um, at resolute Bay. And there's another one over here at, uh, poker flats and it's called the PF ISR and you can see it too. And as you'll see by the image, um, pretty similar design. It's got a whole bunch of little antennas on there. So instead of having 72 foot tall uh, antennas like Harp has, it has a whole bunch of little antennas on a plate. So this is the new style incoherent scatter radars. And you can check all that stuff out. Links to the AMISR on website uh, available and all this stuff. Two megawatts on the poker flat um, ISR. So there's there, these incoherent scatter radars are all over the planet, um, and you can dig into them in my map. Uh, spent many years researching this subject just to put this map together. On to number four, which I find to be the most fascinating. China's Tianhe Project, or as it's uh, translated, Sky River will divert atmospheric rivers using undisclosed technology. I have covered several companies such as Acquiesce, Miles Research, Climate Global Control Trading LLC, which claim to be able to divert atmospheric rivers, tropospheric rivers, or rivers in the sky. Now China is claiming to manage their water resources using this new technology. Once the Tiani uh, project is completed, it will be possible to transfer water in, an, in the air 
via an air corridor. The corridor will be formed as a part of the South to North Water Diversion Project, said Wang Guangpian, uh, an academian from the Chinese Academy of Sciences, the president of the Qingai uh, University. Wang introduced his proposal at a meeting September 9th, which aimed, aimed to jumpstart the novel project. According to the project's description, the atmospheric boundary layer and the troposphere form a passage through which water vapor can be transported in a stable and orderly manner. The passage can be regarded as a tiani, literally a river in the sky. The proposed undertaking has therefore been named the Tiani Project. We monitor the content of migration routes of water vapor and then we conduct interference in certain regions to solve water shortages in northern China. So this is steering rivers in the sky, steering atmospheric rivers. This is something that, you know, I talked about since 2014. And, you know, of course, Metabunk and the debunkers all said, oh, Acquiesce was a scam. Well, I'm about to interview the CEO of Acquiesce who is now called milesresearch.co. Um, his name is David Miles. It is not a scam. Um, the Climate Global Trade Control Trading LLC is claiming to do the exact same thing, to steer rivers in the sky, to steer atmospheric rivers, tropospheric rivers. So this is a thing. It's a real thing. And I've got more details on that. Um, you can read all of that. But this is basically what they're planning on. Six satellites called the Tiani 1 and 2. Interestingly enough, um, sorry, I wasn't screen sharing. I was looking again. This is what it looks like. And this is where they plan on moving the water to. So as you might have seen in my original... Um, As you might have seen in the original, my daughter just woke up. Oh, poor thing. Just one second, guys. Oh, what a poor baby. So, this is where they originally are going to be doing the cloud seeding over Tibet. So they plan on making a whole lot of rain in this area, and then they want to use the rivers of the sky to steer it over here to the desert um, in the Yellow ba River Basin. So that's their big plan. Um, we'll see how that works out. Satellites will seek out and then surround rain cloud hotspots before unspecified technology will guide their clouds to the targets by creating an air channel. This is the same with Aqueous, um, Cyblue, uh, you know, uh, Climate Global Control Trading LLC. They don't want to talk about the technology they're using to steer these atmospheric rivers. Um, but regardless, you know, this is um, something I found on a Chinese forum. The Sky River Satellite. Um, and it talks about this actual satellite that they're going to be um, launching. Is proposed uh, the Sky River project is proposed based on it, which will realize coupling control plan as a whole, using the air, water, and surface resource between different regions, and scientifically analyzing water distribution, transportation patterns in the atmosphere using a new manual intervention technique. New manual intervention technique, whether it's chemical or electrical radio waves nobody's willing to talk about it but at least they're talking about it in public that they're planning on steering in rivers in the sky sky river project is a great significance to solve the problem of water resource in northern china um, and then they show one of the satellites here it's a remote sensing satellite of the sky river project um, and basically this seems to be just a, a water sensor so my original thought was that this possibly could be a microwave um, transmitter 
and that they could be cooking the sky from space. But so far, I haven't been able to, you know, really nail that down. Uh, we'll find out later, I'm sure. And uh, it says the satellite runs at an inclined orbit of 41 degrees at 511 kilometers. It will be equipped with a microwave humidity and temperature sensor, a precipitation survey radar, and a cloud wave water detector. It can realize revisiting in an hour of key regions by six satellites in the network. And they got a little, um, you know, orbital path of all of that. So basically one of the six satellites will be coming over China every hour is, I guess, the plan. Um, not like they all just all six hang out there simultaneously. So we'll see how that works out. Um, oop, skip to the next one. And this is a fascinating video. So I just found this. This is from 2016. Um, boy, they were way ahead of the game. China's Heavenly River. And they're talking about this project. So I want to throw, just throw this out there for you. So the Tiani 1, or Tianhe 1, is three separate things. There is the Tiani 1, which is the you know, river in the sky satellite. There's the Tiani One supercomputer, and there's the Tiani One manned space station. So, what they all have in common, they have the same name. Do they have any kind of relationship? I don't know. But if you want to listen to some fascinating crap, please watch this video. It's by LaRouche Pack Live. Uh, dated November 17, 2016. I was glued to this thing for 47, 44 minutes. And they really go through it. And towards the end, um, they really throw global warming under the bus too because they recognize that, you know, this is more than just, you know, local climate warming, that really there is a large portion of missing climate science that has to do with where we are in the solar system, where we are in the galaxy, the sun, its output. You know, we live in an electric universe and our climate is not a closed system. So it just, it's a fascinating video. Um, they'll really make you think about um, weather modification, you know, and I, I definitely don't agree with a lot of what they say in the video because they're just like, well, you know, it's na it's natural for man. It's it's beautiful for us to be, um, you know, using this, you know, rivers in the sky. Um, I've never ha heard a plant complain about this is imported water. Um, but regardless, listen to it. It's a fascinating discussion. I included it in the article. Uh, for that purpose. So check that out. Again, um, re lots of references on this. Rainmakers in China will move clouds and make it rain in different places using satellites. Um, this is where um, I originally heard about it was on the sun. And of course, you got to take everything you say with a grain of salt. So you got to do some research. And I went through and found all the other links, um, you know, backing all this stuff up. And you can see them here. Tiani Project pr proposes air corridor to advance cross-regional water diversion. The Heavenly River video I just showed. Uh, Tiani Project satellite to debut at Airshow China 2018. Uh, China unveils satellite plans for diverting water through the sky. Satellite model to transfer water via air corridor goes on display china daily 2018 and the um pakistan defense forums where i found those uh images of the actual satellite so there's this is from uh people's daily online this is real as rain so for for people to be steering atmospheric rivers um is a is a massive thing it's nothing to laugh about 
It's something to be taken seriously, and it is the wave of the future. So while everybody talks about harp steering the jet stream, I've been saying since 2014, you need to focus on who's steering atmospheric rivers because this is a real thing that is possible. Uh, Bernard Eastland, um, John Hersher, and just the numbers, the, the, the actual factual numbers, dictate that steering the jet stream requires you know anywhere from around 100 gigawatts um which currently no device on the planet has the power well no known device on the pl planet has the power uh to do but when you've got companies and now the chinese pla the military the weather bureau branch of weather modification in china um bragging about steering atmospheric rivers this is something everybody should be looking into. So just keep that in mind. And finally, our last category for today. Let's bring that up. China's new extremely low frequency ELF transmitter is five times the size of New York City. So China has built a giant experimental radio antenna on a piece of land almost five times the size of New York City, according to researchers involved in the highly controversial project. The Wireless Electromagnetic Method, WEM, project took 13 years to build, but researchers said that it has been finally ready to emit extremely low-frequency radio waves, also known as ELF waves. Those waves can be linked to cancer by the World Health Organization affiliated International Agency for Research on Cancer. Although the project has civilian applications officially, it will be used for earthquake and mineral detection and forms part of China's 11th five-year plan. It could also play a crucial role in military communications. Scientists said the transmissions could be picked up by a submarine lurking hundreds of meters under the sea, thus reducing the vessel's risk of having to resurface to receive transmissions. The, projects follow, the project follows the construction of China's first military-grade super-low-frequency transmission station in 2009. Oh my god, that's not on my map neither. Gosh, I gotta get back to mapping, guys. Um, the next year, the Chinese nuclear submarine successfully communicated with the station from deep water, making China the third country in the world to establish such a submarine communication system after the United States and, States and Russia. But the Chinese Navy is eager to expand its capacity and has been pouring resources into more advanced ELF radio technology, which allows submarines to communicate with command center from a greater depth and is harder to disrupt. The Chinese government, however, has played down the importance of the facility, which occupies some 3,700 square kilometers or 1,400 square miles of land in information released to the public. Apart from a need to protect the important strategic asset, some re researchers said that secrecy was to avoid causing public alarm. And ant the antenna would emit ELF signals with a frequency between 0 0.1 and 300 hertz, the researchers said. So for those of you who don't know a lot about frequency, your brain and the nerves in your body operate in that range. That's why it's a big freaking problem. Because ELF frequencies can interrupt everything from your sleep patterns to hormones to all kinds of stuff. Um, you know, some people will say that it can do mind control. So yeah, crash light, that is a long wire antenna. We're gonna, sh I'm gonna show you that in just a second because basically they've recreated what America created back in the 70s, um, interestingly enough. But ELF, extremely low frequencies, ultra low frequencies, even very low frequencies, VLF, um, is a problem for human beings, brains, nervous systems. So, the, uh, the exact site of the facility has not been disclosed, but information available in the Chinese research journal suggests that the Huazong region, an area in central China, 
that includes Hubei, Henan, and Hunan provinces is home to more than 230 million people, people greater than the population of Brazil. Project WEM's main surface structure is a pair of high-voltage power supply lines stretching from north to south, east to west, on a steel lattice towers, which form a cross that is 60 kilometers, 37 miles wide, and 80 kilometers to 100 kilometers, 50 to 62 miles long. This is exactly like what they created in America. To show you in just a minute. At the end of each power line, because that's what they are, they are wires on steel lattice towers. They are exactly identical to what you see when you're driving down the interstate and you see those high power lines that are way up in the air, identical. But this is a radio transmission system for extremely low frequencies. At the end of each power line, thick copper wire goes underground through a deep borehole. Two power stations generate strong currents and electrify the ground in slow repeating pulses, turning the earth underfoot into an active source of electromagnetic radiation. It actually uses the ground as a transmitter as well. The radio pulses patent not only pass through the atmosphere but travel through the earth's crust as well with a range up to 3500 kilometers almost 2200 miles according to the project scientists a sensitive receiver within that range which is roughly the distance between china and singapore or guam would be able to pick up these signals the closer to the power source the stronger the pulses the radar will be difficult for spy satellites to detect because it will appear no different than an ordinary power grid. Although a radar expert, expert said that it might be possible to detect its emissions and use, use those to determine the location. The inland location of the new facility would also make it harder for an enemy to attack compared with a facility located near the coast. Alright, so I'm just going to skip down here and read the most important parts because this is great. The International Agency for Research on Cancer, part of the World Health Organization, has previously warned that ELF waves are possibly carcinogenic to humans. Numerous epidemiological and experimental studies conducted by researchers around the world have linked long-term ELF exposure to increased risk of childhood leukemia. In a 500-page report, constantly updated since 2007. The WHO has documented a large number of academic investigations linking ELF radi radiation to a range of illness including delusions, sleep deprivation, stress, <coughs> stress, depression, breast and brain tumors, miscarriages, and suicide. Though many results remain inconclusive, the WHO has said implementation of precautionary procedures to reduce exposure was reasonable and warranted. Chen declined to com comment on the impact the facility would have on residents' health, of course. Uh, but it goes on down here. In 1968, the U.S. Navy proposed Project Sanguine. A giant ELF antenna that would cover more than two-fifths of the state of Wisconsin to enable undersea communications with submarines. The project was terminated due to massive protests by residents. The residents were experiencing something called the Taos hum. They were hearing tonight they were having tinnitus and hearing hums in their heads. People were jumping the fences and cutting the wires. That's not in the article. Uh, the U.S. Navy built a smaller transmitter, the Wisconsin Test Facility, with two 45-kilometer power lines in Clam Lake area, a place with a low population density. The station emitted ELF waves at 76 hertz and was decommissioned over a decade ago. In the 1980s, the Soviet Union constructed ZEVs, a considerably more powerful facility on the Kola Peninsula in the Arctic Circle. The Zev's antenna was powered by two 60-kilometer electric lines and had a made frequency tuned to 82 hertz. 
The radio waves it produced were believed powerful enough to reach Russian nuclear submarines hidden deep under the Arctic ice sea cap. Russia has since provided technical support to China and started building its own systems, which may include other ELF stations in coastal areas. According to the WHO, ELF field can affect human nerve fibers and stimulate synaptic transmissions in neural networks. It can also affect retina cells, generating a sporadic flash of light in people's eyes. Animals can use low frequency signals to detect threats or changes in surrounding environments, an ability critical for survival in nature. According to some biologists, an experiment suggests that ELF radiation could also have an effect on cattle. So what they're talking about there is that, you know, whenever there's about to be uh, an earthquake, extremely low frequency waves are generated along the ground and the deer will put their head to the ground and they will hear that and they will bolt and you'll hear all the animals splitting, you know, um, you know, lots of things create natural, extremely low frequency waves, but creating them, you know, with these man-made uh, transmitters could be possibly causing you know, these mass strandings of uh, whales, uh, birds crashing into Walmart parking lots, all kinds of crazy stuff because, you know, we all respond differently to electromagnetic signals and animals don't have a clue WTF is going on. So that's a big concern. Um, but regardless, read the rest of the article. It's pretty lengthy. And here is an actual picture of the project uh, WEM system. The transmitter will be somewhere in here. It's going to be really big. And they got a sensor array over here. And they got a sensor array over here. And then they've got two supercomputers over here. They also have mobile monitoring stations and permanent monitoring stations are the triangles. So they've got these all here. And I guess these are the mobile ones. They could be driving all around this area. Who knows? Um, but regardless, they're going to use it for spelunking, cave diving, searching for gold and oil underground, and talking to submarines. Oh, by the way, it might screw with your brain waves. So they mentioned that it was on cables in the air. They look like this. This is Project Sanguine's 76 hertz elf transmitter cables. Um, and that's exactly what they look like up there in the top, three separate lines. Now, interestingly enough, they were like, well, it's not really much to be concerned about because the ELF transmitter in China is only going to be 10 watts. Now, it's going to put out 10 watts. I just wanted to give you a little perspective on this. The one that we had in, uh, this is the one in Clam Lake, Wisconsin. And you can see this is three kilometers. Like they said, it was 50 by 60 kilometers. Huge. I mean, freaking huge. And this is the one in Republic, Michigan, shaped like an F for FU. Um, you can see both of these on Climate Viewer 3D by clicking here. And you can see all of the ELF and VLF transmitters of the world. Uh, this took a minute to make. I can promise you that. But regardless, right here are the two ELF and VLF transmitters we're talking about. They're right in the Great Lakes um, area. So you scroll down here and you can actually see where they're cut through the trees. There's the tree line. And that's where the wires run. Yes, I am such a nerd. I trace that all the way out. Er, my gosh. Um, but there's the ELF transmitter and the details on it. Lots of links to stuff like that. Um, but this is exactly the same thing that they're building right now in China. Is an ELF transmitter similar to this one. So if you hit map controls, you can see this is the, the one at Clam Lake, Wisconsin, or, uh, yeah. And then the other one at Republic, Michigan, right here, go back and you can see how big it is. So much, you know, more people live around here apparently. So they were really complaining about it, but so they, anyway. 
So there's the F, there's the, the X. This is the design they're using in China right now. And there is Zev's, the 82 Hertz one. And apparently I just learned today that it also is on some pretty long lines. So that's probably what this is right here. That's the actual line. It ain't a dirt road. Um, but regardless, and you see these lines going out this way, I'll have to actually go and dig a little deeper so I can map them out as well. But this is the Russian Zev's 82 Hertz um, ELF transmitter. So basically they've, uh, and they said that it was 10 decibels more powerful than the US one. Back to what I was saying. So the one in the US is one watt. It was one watt worth of output. They put three million watts into it just to give you an idea so three million watts over those power lines over all of those miles created a one watt signal that could be heard worldwide harp up in alaska has a better gain so they put 3.6 million watts into it and they actually can get 5 billion watts worth of effective radiated power. The one in Clam Lake, Wisconsin, in Republic, Michigan, 3 million watts went into it. One watt came out of it. And it created a 76 hertz tone that was heard worldwide. Same thing with the one in Zev's. Same thing is going to happen in China. Oh, wait. China says their output will be 10 watts. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. So that's your uh, big story for today. Five mind blowing, um, you know, experiments going on in China. I hope that you guys will check out the related articles um, to this. You know, I've got stuff from when I covered China's cover in Tibet and thousands of cloud seeding generators. China's new harp playing guy with weather, cloud seeding gambling with your weather, how cloud seeding is very unpredictable, ionospheric heaters, how they really work, Trump Space Force fired a harp because, as Trump would say, space, it's where it's at. Um, right now, we are in a space war. That's why there are all of these missile defense radars and ELF, VLF transmitters and incoherent scatter radars. And oh, by the way, there are things like kamikaze satellites that have bombs on them waiting to blow up other satellites. Or, um, you know, these uh, hijacker satellites which have an arm and can come pull another satellite out of orbit and throw it down to the ground. Or they could just shoot a laser beam at it and blind the satellites. So we're in a space war right now. That's why China's gearing up with these ionospheric heaters and all this stuff. And I hope that you guys will check that out. How the Chinese tried to blind US satellites. So check out the related links. Blue gold rush in the water wars using the rivers of the troposphere. Um, Acquiesce side blue and steering the rivers of the sky. Read the articles on atmospheric rivers. Um, check out my two presentations, Geoengineering, Weather Modification, and Weaponizing Nature. The Climate Changers and Water Wars, Technocracy, Geoengineering, and Replacing the Water Cycle. And my Geoengineering and Heart page. And if that ain't enough for you, um, make sure you go over and check out weathermodificationhistory.com on the interactive timeline where you can go through everything from 1800 to present and really get acquainted with the secret world of weather modification, geoengineering, and burning holes in the ionosphere. So guys, China's on fire. They're spending all of those dollars we spent at Walmart to build all this crazy wacky stuff. And it's, it's partly our fault. <laughs> oh wait, but they hacked us to get all this information anyway. So we've been at World War III for about 10 years. It's a cyber war and a space war and a weather war. 
And this is going to continue for quite some time. So there'll be plenty to cover on Climate Viewer News. I hope that you guys will stay tuned. And I also hope that you guys will continue to support my work on patreon.com slash climate viewer or give a one-time donation on paypal.me slash climate viewer or gofundme.com slash climate viewer. Um, yes, this will, uh, what could possibly go wrong? Uh, how's about everything? <laughs> uh, I, you know, I, I, I just sit back and I look at this stuff and I go, what are we going to do about the climate changers? Well, you know, if you watch that video, the one that I was talking so much about um, from the LaRouche pack, you know, it'll give you a, like an insight into the mindset of those who just see this as a natural progression of things. You know, we controlled mountaintops. You blow the whole damn top off of it. We control the groundwater. We control, you know, let's frack everything. Um, why not control the sky? And that's the idea that these technocrats have. Um, you know, these Council of Foreign Relation, Bilderberger, Trilateral Commission Club of Rome, uh, you know, they there are betters. They know better and they want to control everything. So that's why I call them the technocrats and the climate changers. They want to control the water and they will, whether you like it or not. So I seriously hope that you guys will support my Environmental Modification Accountability Act. It's available at climateviewer.com slash nmod. And maybe we can uh, bring at least some transparency to this world so that we know when these people are modifying the sky and if people are up to no good, up to nefarious intentions, that we can, you know, prosecute them in a court of law or, you know, hold them criminally liable because weather warfare is banned. And the only way to ever, you know, catch somebody in the act is to build a sensor network to, to actually do that. So, guys, thank you so much for tuning into this episode. I hope that you will share it. Please press that like button. Slam that like button down as they say and uh leave me a comment if you uh, were late to the party and didn't get to see the show um tell me what you think about um china and uh them spending all the money we sent them on uh screwing with the weather screwing with the ionosphere and apparently screwing with people's brains so guys you've been informed and with that information comes power and with power comes great responsibility so all i ask is that you remember attack ideas night not people and have a happy 2019 it's going to be epic